um, Peter. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, the Workman family um, as an example of a middle class elite family um, in 19th century Belfast. Um, we have a former Miss Workman here in the audience, so um, it'll be hopefully informative and interesting um, for everyone. Um, in the 19th century, Belfast's industrial elite, like the city over which it presided, represented a new and upwardly mobile phenomenon. The Belfast bourgeoisie formed a highly distinctive and important sector of the urban population. Mostly manufacturers and merchants, they oversaw the transformation of Belfast from a market town at the start of the 19th century to a highly, highly prosperous industrial base. This dominant class was composed of young men taking advantage of the unique opportunities that industrialisation and municipal reform had made possible in Belfast. So in the last two uh, decades of the 18th century, the middle classes in Belfast were composed mainly of merchants and traders with a number of cotton manufacturers. By the mid-19th century, the economy had seen a massive growth in textiles, particularly in linen. While commerce was still very important, linen was a greater source of income by the mid-19th uh, century. Shipbuilding achieved preeminence as a major industry later in the century. Belfast was a firmly middle-class town. It had freed itself from its aristocratic owners, the Dougal family, uh, when they were forced to sell off most of their estates due to debt in the 1820s and 1850s. Much of the land uh, that had been owned by the Donegals was snapped up by uh, textile industrialists, including the Workman family. This paper will focus on the Workmans of Belfast. Uh, it will cover three generations of this family, who in several ways typified the Belfast elite. Scottish-descended Presbyterian textile industrialists, the Workmans were highly involved in the town's civic, religious and charitable institutions. They put their stamp firmly upon the physical, civic, economic and religious development of the town. While the Workman family maintained strong business and family links with Scotland and England, they were also strongly committed to Belfast's civic life and growth over three generations. By charting the story of this influential family, the historian cannot fail but to touch on important social, economic, cultural and political themes in Irish and, more particularly, in Ulster urban history. The economic success of the Workman family, from cotton weavers at the start of the century to major shipbuilders at the end, mirrored the phenomenal growth and success of Belfast in the 19th century. Politically, a development can be traced in the family from radical at the start of the century to liberal before turning unionist in the 1890s. Before going any further, it is worth commenting on definitions of elite. In my research, I have prioritised Richard Trainer's definition of the civic elite, those individuals who held leadership posts in the major institutions of the town. Based on this definition, I used street directories and other sources to identify over 800 people who, between 1840 and 1870, served on official bodies in Belfast, such as the Belfast Corporation or the Harbour Commissioners, or on the committees of charities or other voluntary societies. Many influential citizens, such as the Workman family, were highly involved in voluntary associations, which have been regarded by social historians such as Robert Morris and Simon Gunn as key indicators of middle class identity and culture. I'm going to look at three generations of the Workman family, um, starting with the brothers John and Robert Workman, then moving on to John's son Robert, and then finally Robert's son Thomas. Like many of Belfast's successful 19th century industrialists, the Workman brothers um, came to the up and coming town of Belfast at the start of the century. John and Robert moved here from Saltcoats, a small port in Ayrshire on the west coast of Scotland. 
They arrived around 1808 at the ages of 32. That was uh, John and his younger brother Robert, who was 18. In salt coats, their father ran a small scale but in, uh, successful cotton weaving industry. In the textile industry, relations between Scotland and Belfast were close, and when they made the decision to migrate, the brothers would have been aware of the expansion of the Belfast cotton industry. The textile business was the primary catalyst for relations and movements across the Irish Sea. Like the Workman family, other textile manufacturers came to Belfast from industrial regions of England and Scotland. These included uh, the Lancashire-born Nicholas Grimshaw, uh, father of the successful flax spinner James Grimshaw, and the father of John Hind, also engaged in the linen trade, who was a prominent Manchester spinner. When I studied the origins of the Belfast civic elite, I found the elite included a much greater proportion of outsiders than the town's population did as a whole. Um, in the 19, 1840s and 1860s, the percentage of Belfast inhabitants born outside the town of Belfast was around a quarter. However, for the civic elite, it was a much larger 64%. This 64% included anyone born outside of Belfast, but a sizable proportion came from Scotland and <coughs> England. And indeed, over one-fifth of the most civically <coughs> active members of the elite came from Scotland and England. <coughs> A workman uh, family memoir uh, records that before coming to Belfast, John and Robert were each given £20,000 from their father, but it's impossible to verify this amount. They certainly brought capital with them, and both brothers settled in Little Patrick Street, between York Street and Corporation Street, from where they set up a Muslim manufacturing business. While cotton spinning was already a factory operation uh, employing steam power, weaving was still done on hand looms, predominantly in the weavers' homes. Uh, the workman business consisted uh, primarily of buying cotton yarn, having it woven into cloth by hand loom weavers, and then getting it bleached and finished by other hands. Business records show the brothers um, in the 1820s importing cotton from the West Indies. Finished goods were sold abroad. In addition to textiles, uh, both John and Robert were part owners of ships and they operated as general merchants when opportunities afforded. In the 1820s and 30s, records show them shipping goods such as sugar, coffee and rum. It was common for Belfast manufacturers to simultaneously operate as merchants and ship owners and indeed this was the case for the workman family throughout the century. When John, pictured with his wife Helen, arrived in Belfast, the population was around 20,000. It was to rise to over 70,000 before he died in 1846. In 1829 to 30, John built two houses in Donegal Square East, um, getting a lease from Lord Donegal. His brother Robert, uh, who I don't have a, a picture of, um, also moved from Little Patrick Street uh, to York Street where his neighbours included Andrew Mulholland, Edward Coy and William Dargan, all to become prominent names in Belfast. I looked at, uh, in their business records, um, at the subscriptions taken out um, by the business, um, meaning the, uh, what they donated money to. So this is a list in between 1826 1828 every year they gave uh, the amounts to um, those institutions um, so you can see a lot of support for, for charities for churches uh, bible societies um, and for the natural history society with which the family was to be involved uh, throughout the entire 19th century um, a decade later subscriptions were uh, donated to these institutions or projects. So you can see uh, a decade on, they're supporting more uh, things and also uh, larger amounts of money are going. So the, the top one there, you can see that they're supporting uh, the election campaign of uh, Liberal candidate James Gibson, who was elected in 1836. Um, you can also see that they are 
uh, giving to a lot of churches. So there's a great wave of church building uh, taking off around this time in Belfast. And um, they're supporting um, every uh, possible denomination, uh, including uh, Catholic churches. So they're quite ecumenical. Um, in fact, all three generations of the Workman family um, were involved in planting churches. Uh, they were the main impetus behind, behind five churches in Belfast, Presbyterian churches, May Street, Elmwood, Fitzroy, Belmont and Hallands Bay. Both John and Robert uh, lent large amounts of their time as well as their money to the developing civic and religious life of the town. Um, indeed, civic responsibility was a key characteristic of the leading manufacturers and merchants um, who actively involved themselves in the civic life of the town. The brothers served on various committees, some of them purely philanthropic, while others uh, served their business interests. So both of them served regularly on the grand jury. Uh, John Workman in the 1830s and 40s was on the committee of the Belfast Botanic Gardens and served in the management committee of the Frederick Street Lancast Lancasterian School. His brother Robert was a committee member of the Ulster Female Penitentiary, a proprietor of the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, and on the managing committee of the General Hospital. Both were active members of the Anti-Slavery Society, of which Robert was treasurer, and both were um, on the uh, Belfast Banking Company, members of the Chamber of Commerce, directors of the Corn Exchange. Both brothers bought shares in several railway companies and sat on the boards of the Belfast and Ballymena Railway Company and the Ulster Railway Company. They did very well out of investments in railways and their sons, the future generations, continued to benefit um, being major shareholders in the railway companies. Their sons also were to become harbour commissioners, positions which helped promote their own interests as well as that of the Port of Belfast. Politically, the Workman family were always liberal, but John Workman was the most radically inclined in the family. Until his death in 1846, John supported the Oconolite movements for emancipation and repeal. When Daniel O'Connell visited Belfast in 1841, there were a handful of Protestants present at the welcome dinner. One of them is John Workman. There's some evidence that John supported universal franchise in the 1830s, and other evidence shows that both brothers believed the franchise property qualification should be lowered. A prominent anti-corn law and pro-free trade campaigner, John corresponded with Richard Cobden in the 1840s. And in 1852, uh, Robert attended a banquet in honour of John Bright. The subjects celebrated at this Belfast banquet in 1852 included free trade, vote by ballot, tenant right and electoral independence. It was agreed, however, that, quote, to prevent any embarrassment, no volunteer toasts should be offered. In his published letters on the topic of free trade, John railed against the landed classes and condemned them for protectionist laws under which he believed the working classes suffered the most. John wasn't afraid to promote the interests of the working classes ahead of his own sons, and in 1838, during a commission investigating the distress of handloom weavers, John condemned his sons for depressing weavers' wages and publicly disassociated himself from them, calling them oppressors of the working classes. Both John and Robert were fervently um, anti-slavery. Robert was a joint secretary of the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, Belfast Branch, and he entertained two former slaves, one of whom was uh, Frederick Douglass, at his home in Queen's Elms, where he moved from after he lived at York Street. A family memoir recounts that at family soirees held on Saturday evenings, the subject of anti-slavery was constantly discussed by the entire party, young and old. Moments before he had a fatal heart attack in 1860, Robert had apparently been speaking with animation about the American War and abolition. Um, to look at the brothers' um, religious life, John was closely associated with the building of May Street Presbyterian Church in 1829 and in bringing Henry Cook to Belfast to be its minister. He lent £3,700 towards the building of May Street Church. 
But canny Scotsman as he was, he got the money back at 6% interest. John's supporting of the orthodox politically conservative Cook seems at odds with his political beliefs. There is evidence indicating that John's religious beliefs were unorthodox. Um, His nephew described his uncle as a radical in opinion who read Tom Paine and was somewhat sceptical in religion. John's brother, Robert of York Street, who attended an independent church in Donegal Street, showed signs of Sabbatarianism, believing trains should not run on Sundays. Um, However, his campaign for the closing of spirit shops on Sundays was rooted more in temperance convictions than anything else. Throughout the three generations, the family supported temperance, but not teetotalism, as there are accounts of them drinking wine. In 1852, the Workmans opened a new gaslit warehouse in Bedford Street. By this time, um, the sons of John Sr., Robert and John were in business together and their cousin William had also joined his father Robert in the muslin industry. Um, When the warehouse opened the Northern Whig reported that just a year before there had been nothing on that street at all. This is about Belfast in 1852 so Bedford Street's here Um, but it predicted that now there were four new textile warehouses it would be our future Bond Street. Um, The workmen's continued to market plain and sewn muslin in the United Kingdom and overseas. But the move to Bedford Street, it becomes clear they were also engaged in manufacturing because machinery was installed on a floor of the warehouse. And the Northern Whig reported that the Bedford Street building would have 50 warping mills and winding machines. And the company supplied muslin, gingham and check webs to about 3,000 weavers. In addition to the Bedford Street warehouse, The family owned property on Corporation Street, which also included offices, a warehouse and a warping place. So the importance of the textile industry in Belfast, um, it's shown by the fact that the most civically active members of the urban elite and the wealthiest citizens of Belfast um, were textile industrialists. In 1847, the Times newspaper noted that the linen trade of Ulster has mainly contributed to create that wealthy middle class and to maintain that comfort among the peasantry which renders these districts such a contrast to the other parts of the island. So context of this obviously um, is during the famine crisis. Moving on then to the next generation, Robert, um, the son of John, known as Robert of Ciara, um, the son of John Workman of Donegal Square, Like many mercantile sons, Robert entered an apprenticeship in his father's business at the age of 15, at which time he left formal education. After his marriage to Jane Service, a distant cousin and a daughter of a Glasgow cotton manufacturer, the couple lived first in King Street near Smithfield, then from the early 1840s at Pakenham Place, a three-storey terrace on the Dublin Road. In 1854, the family, with now over a dozen children, moved to the newly built villa, Ciara, on Windsor Avenue. Um, At the same time, Robert's brother, John, moved to, around the same time, uh, a villa called Edgecombe uh, at Strand Town. So this type of move was typical of the Belfast elite at this time. In, in the 1840s, the elite was still living close to the centre, um, many in traditional bourgeois streets of Donegal Place, College Square, etc. But the mid-century saw the suburbs um, created on the Malone Ridge and at the Antrim Road. More and more middle-class people were being attracted away from the town centre. Ciara um, was named after a cotton-growing state in northeast Brazil. Robert had found new markets for muslin in North and South America, and Ciara in Brazil was one of his favourite ports of call. Um, like his, his, father's, uh, or his father and his uncle, religion played a large role in Robert of Ciara's life. In 1818, at the age of 14, Robert had become a Sunday school teacher uh, in the Brown Street Sunday schools, and he was to remain a Sunday school teacher for the rest of his life. 
Um, he was superintendent in May Street Church Sunday School. He later set up his own Sunday School class in his home in Pakenham Place. He used his influence to build the Victoria Place Sunday School off Great Victoria Street to cater for the working class children of nearby Sandy Row. Robert had inherited from his father a firm belief in freedom of conscience. He lobbied the Presbyterian General Assembly to this effect in 1850. Throughout the century, we find the family consistently support the voluntary principle, believing strongly in religious freedom and particularly in disestablishment, the separation of church and state, um, in order to preserve independence of churches. Despite being an elder um, in May Street Presbyterian Church, Robert actually left it after falling out with Henry Cook over the voluntary controversy. He believed ministers should not receive state support of the Regium Donum. Um, so in 1849, he joined Dr. Edgar's congregation in Alfred Street Presbyterian Church, where he also became an elder. When he moved out to Windsor, he was, uh, Robert was instrumental in setting up Elmwood Presbyterian Church in 1858. Like his father, Robert of Ciara, and also his son, were actively involved in Belfast Town Mission, and in the Anti-Slavery Society. Um, moving on to Roberts of Ciara's son, Thomas. Uh, so he had 15 children. Thomas was the third oldest son and the seventh child. Um, we know that Thomas attended Belfast Academy in 1853 when he was 10 years old and later he moved on to the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, INST. Typically, members of the Belfast elite began their education privately or in a local school before going on to INST. Educational journeys could be diverse. Uh, for example, Thomas's uh, cousin, who became Robert Work Reverend Robert Workman of Newton Breda, was taught by a combination of his mother, a governess, his aunt, his grandfather, and a stint at Belfast Academy before going on to Queen's and then to Edinburgh. Those uh, middle class men who were intended for church ministry or the professions went to university um, until Queen's opened in 1849, the vast majority went to Glasgow and Edinburgh. But those who were intended for business careers shunned university education until much later in the century. In the 1860s, Thomas, um, this is a cartoon of him uh, in front of uh, the Bedford Street, the Bedford Street warehouse, just making fun of his moustache, basically. Um, Thomas, rather than attend Queen's, he entered the Muslim business with his brother, George Augustus. By this time, the family had branched out into linen as well as muslin. This appears to have taken place during the Cotton Famine of 1862-3, when T and G A Workman was established to meet the big expansion of the linen business. The bulk of the personal papers um, in the Workman Archive at Prony relates to Tom and his cousin, the Reverend Robert Workman of Newton Breda. Tom's papers provide an insight into his social and leisure habits, particularly as a young man. Most socialising took place among family, both in Belfast and in Scotland at times. Letters uh, between family members are a mixture of business and family news. Saturday night was a fixed social occasion when various branches of the Workman family took it in turns to host gatherings of the wider family. Correspondence reveals that Tom and his brothers and sisters attended concerts at the Ulster Hall and public lectures at Queen's College. This was an interesting archive, which um, is party invitations and dance cards. Um, these are social occasions uh, parties uh, with dancing which took place in private homes among friends and acquaintances. Most of them took place during the Christmas and New Year season when families were in town. So you can see some of the, um, when you look at where Tom is, is going, it's a combination of friends, acquaintances, Norwood Tower was owned by J.A. Henderson who owns the newsletter. So not necessarily all uh, liberals. Uh, they found evidence of conservative voting families, 
most of them were kind of our Presbyterians. Um, if you look inside these, you can see find the dance cards with the engagements. Um, so this is a time in Tom's life before he is married. These dancing parties clearly form part of the social calendar designed to enable young couples to meet and initiate courtships. Um, I only find dance cards relating to this earlier unmarried period of Tom's life. There's no indication that the workman family or other middle class families took part in public dancing or indeed attended the theatre. For many of the Belfast Victorian elite, the theatre was not regarded as a respectable place to be seen. Although several sources testified to the fact that members of the Belfast elite had no such scruples when in London or in Edinburgh. Um, Tom's two passions were yachting and natural history. Uh, he owned yachts um, at weekends. He took his yacht out during the summer holidays, went as far as Scotland and around the Scottish coast. This, I found this picture um, of the family, a grainy picture, but it's called a yachting picnic um, somewhere along the coast. Um, like most middle class families, the, the workmans took a house each summer um, for one or two months in coastal resorts such as Bangor, Hollywood, Whitehead, Larne or Malai. Middle class summer holidays were greatly facilitated by the railway with the Belfast to Hollywood railway opening in 1848. The family also holidayed with relatives uh, on the Ayrshire coast and also holidayed in, on the continent. Holidays took place there from the 1860s with Switzerland being a favourite of Robert of Ciara. By the end of the 19th century, Belfast was known more for its hard-headed business character than for its culture or cosmopolitan outlook. Yet the Workman family epitomised a society type that was both cultured and cosmopolitan. Several family members, including Thomas Workman and his cousin, the Reverend Robert Workman, spoke foreign languages, travelled widely, both for business and for pleasure, and were leading members of national, associational and scientific communities. At least 11 members of the Workman family were members of the Belfast Natural um, Histo um, History and Philosophical Society during its first 100 years from 1821 to 1921. Robert of Ciara was an early and prominent member um, from 1828. He and his brother John Workman gave papers to the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society in the 1830s. In 1852, during the visit to Belfast of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, the Workmans hosted two soirees at their newly opened Bedford Street uh, warehouse. Thomas Workman's travels combined promoting linen and muslin goods in overseas markets and pursuing his interests in natural history. He visited countries including Brazil, India, China, Burma, Singapore and Ceylon. On his journeys, he collected butterflies and spiders. In 1896, he published a book on Malaysian spiders in which he had identified several new species. Thomas was vice president and then president of the Belfast Naturalist Field Club and he became president of the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society in 1898. Um, he hosted at least one field excursion at his home in Craig Dara, where he had moved with his wife and children in 1880. Um, so it's the uh, grounds go down to Belfast Loch um, at St. Hel it's Helen's Bay. Like his father and grandfather, Tom was the driving force uh, behind building the local Presbyterian church uh, where he moved, Helen's Bay Presbyterian. Like other members of his family, he insisted on installing an organ to aid worship, which was a controversial step in the Presbyterian Assembly at this time. Finally, uh, the final workman um, I will look at is Frank Workman, who might possibly the, be the best known. He was Tom's younger brother, the youngest of 15 children. Frank ended up as the wealthiest of the family, although he had started with less than his older brothers. 
Um, not every son could go into the family business, especially in a family with 15 children. So while the four oldest sons were catered for in the family business, the younger sons had to find their own way. Of Tom's younger brothers, uh, Charles became a medical doctor, Harry went to London to enter the shipbroking business, and Frank opened a shipyard with his cousin George Clark, who supplied the capital. Workman Clark and Co. opened in 1880 and became the second um, shipyard in Belfast after Harlan and Wolfe. Every generation of the family had owned or part-owned ships, but Frank was the only, only one who embarked on shipbuilding. The family links, uh, family importance remained strong, with Thomas Workman being the largest shareholder, a director and then vice chairman. The Scotsman Charles E. Allen became a partner in 1893, so it's significant to note that the Workmans, Clarks and Allens were all related and could all trace their origins to 18th century salt coats. Of this third generation, Frank, uh, the youngest son, and his eldest brother, John, um, John of Lismore, were the most civically active. Frank became a councillor in Belfast while his brother John stood for election as a Liberal candidate for South Belfast in 1885. One of the subjects um, that John discussed in his campaign launch in November 1885 was the importance of free trade, now in the context of Tory party debate over tariff protection. John also stood for non-sectarian education and for the closing of museums and art galleries on Sundays, similar principles to those that his grandfather and great uncle had campaigned for 80 years before. By the 1880s, the rise of the Nationalist Party in Ireland had led to the diminishing of the Liberal Party. John failed to win a seat and the election resulted in 18 Irish Conservatives being voted in and not a single Liberal. Thomas um, was less involved, Thomas of Craig Dara, in political concerns than other family members, but he did participate in mass agitation over Home Rule. In 1892, a local committee nominated him as a delegate to the Ulster Unionist Convention in Belfast in June of that year. Like many Liberal Presbyterians, the Workman family were against Home Rule and Tom's children actually, uh, took part in the Larne gun running of uh, 1914. Um, when I visited the Craig Dara estate this summer, I noticed this rifle lying around. And <laughs> I asked to take a photo of it. It um, was recently found buried at the back of a shed uh, in the walled garden, part of a cache hidden during the gun running um, of 1914 that got left behind. This image of a rusted 100-year-old rifle dumped shortly before the outbreak of the First World War symbolises um, a new generation of the Workman family which went off to fight in the First World War and a new era in Belfast history, but that is not for me to discuss today, so I'll end my discussion here. Thank you.